of the U.S. and China headed towards a naval war in Asia. The United States does not have a coherent strategy to deal with the rising People's Republic of China in the Western Pacific. Nor do foreign policy experts specializing in the Asia. Pacific region have a concrete set of ideas to coax an increasingly assertive Beijing into accepting the U.S. comma led post-Second World War liberal institutional world order to reassert Washington's dominance in the region. It is becoming increasingly clear that China hopes to chart its own course independent of the existing Western frameworks as Beijing reaffirms its claims to the South China Sea and continues to build artificial islands in the region. But how policymakers in Washington will deal with the issue is an open question. U.S. Policy has failed spectacularly. Quote, Seth Krop C., a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, told a small lunch gathering at the Center for the National Interest, which is the foreign policy think tank that publishes the national interest on SEPT. 28. China's actions show that it sees us as a strategic competitor. We choose to see China as a large market that can be cajoled and persuaded into joining us as a defender of international security and economic security. U.S. Policymakers hope that the large volume of trade between China and the U.S. and the accompanying economic progress in the former would remold Chinese rulers to look, think and act more like us. The evidence does not support this hope. Quote, but while the Chinese see the United States as a strategic competitor, experts agree that a military confrontation is not a foregone conclusion. Beijing hopes that it can force the United States to de facto accept the South China Sea as its territory. I don't think conflict naval or otherwise between the U.S. and China is inevitable, Crops he said more likely is that China will continue its effort to turn the international waters of the East and South China Sea into territorial waters. Quote, China is using a multi-pronged approach to deny you. S. Naval and Air Forces access to the region using a sophistical network of anti- access or area denial A2AD weapons. Additionally, Beijing is actively working to intimidate and harass U.S. allies in the region in the hopes that they will acquiesce to Chinese demands. But Beijing is not just using its military forces in its efforts to force America and its allies. For the region, the China is using paramilitary forces and maritime militia to harass fishermen and other commercial users of those water from other nations in order to gain de facto control over the East and South China Seas. I do think that if U.S. policy continues largely to overlook increasing Chinese aggression off its international waters on its south coasts, the prospects for a Chinese hegemony will increase as our Asian friends and allies seek new accommodations, new trading partners and new security arrangements. Cropsey said. Our willingness to resist China's challenge to the international order is not growing. Quote, indeed. Cropsey argues that American sea power is shrinking and that the naval balance in the western Pacific is tilting toward China's favor. The U.S. Congress simply does not understand how grave the situation is, Cropsey said. The United States must remember its large economic stake in Asia and the alliance network that girds those interests. Instead of encouraging China to become a stakeholder in the international system, our goal ought to be to use diplomacy, military strength, including increased presence, to convince China that we will protect the international order and ultimately, for this is what is at stake here. The United States is broad interest in retaining our current position as a great power, Cropsey said. While Cropsey suggested that the United States shifts towards protecting its power in the Western Pacific. But he did not suggest any concrete course of action on exactly how Washington might achieve those aims. 
Retaining America's position as the preeminent power in the West and Pacific likely requires a concerted grand strategy on the scale of President Harry S. Truman's NSC-68, which formulated America's response to the Soviet threat in 1950. However, most of the discussion focused on low-level policy questions directly relating to freedom of navigation phone in the South China Sea in policing fisheries. Jeff Smith, director of Asian security programs at the American Foreign Policy Council, who was speaking alongside Crop C, told the audience that China has been very clear that it does not believe you. S. Military forces should be operating in the East and South China Seas. Beijing has made the calculation that it cannot effective prevent the United States from operating in the region right now, but as Chinese naval capabilities grow that might change. There is a lot to suggest one day they may well be in a position to restrict the navigation of the U.S. military and believe they're in a position to do so, Smith said. So the prospect for some kind of confrontation there is very real. Quote, the United States despite never having ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea UNCLOS, interprets international law as allowing its warships to operate and conduct surveillance within any nation's exclusive economic zone EEZ and pass through a nation's 12 nautical mile territorial waters under innocent passage. Quote, that interpretation is widely accepted by the majority of maritime nations.